What is up, guys? And welcome back to the Fortman Podcast. Today, my guest is a good friend and someone that I've been wanting to have on the podcast for a while now. And I'm so stoked that Ben Stewart is finally joining me on the Fortman Podcast to talk all things, uh, just everything. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't know where our conversation is going to go, but I'm really excited about it. Let's do it. Let's go wide ranging. I love it. Let's, hey, let's let's go wide ranging and deep. Okay. You yeah. Know? yeah. I'm down I'm, for that. I'm, I'm down for it. Well, if you don't know Ben, um, you probably live under a rock. Just kidding. But Ben's a husband, father, an author, a uh, pastor, uh, Passion City Church in D.C., and he's uh, just one of my favorite people. Well, thanks, brother. Well, I'm happy to be here, man. I, you know, I love that you're doing this, Christian. And um, I, I was just reading an article this morning. Uh, it's in the Washington Post. Christine Emba wrote an article about the crisis of masculinity, you know, and and that's mm-hmm. been kind of a thing, you know, that people talk about and whatever, but she's coming from, I, I think it'd be fair to say more of a left-leaning perspective, but she's sort of addressing her crowd of saying like, hey, we've sort of dismissed that that men need guidance and, and men need counsel and a plan and a purpose. And and she said, but that's real. And the, we need to help men succeed. And li- and so it was interesting for her coming from the secular angle going, hey, there needs to be a place where men can learn how to be what they're meant to be. And it's funny because, you know, it's Washington Post. So, but by the end of it, they're, they're stumbling backwards yeah. into biblical truth about what it is to grow up and be a man. So I just love that you do this and you create this space for guys. And man, I'm happy to be a part of it. Well, thank you, man. Yeah, it really is. You know, just something I'm passionate about of like, you know, the avenue of fitness and and really kind of started just this idea of, you know, I was talking to Willie early on, but just this idea of, you know, if you look at the gospels, when Jesus met Peter, he met Peter fishing because that's what Peter did, right? And he mm-hmm. spoke to him and really used, you know, fishing things. I'll make you a fisher of men. He, you know, so there's there's things that you can do, whether it's hobby related or, or job oriented or whatever, but how do you relate to people that, you know, what audience do you want to kind of reach? And for me, I, I love sports and fitness and, you know, just trying to pull people out of the whole self-consuming fitness side of it and really on how to, you know, train and actually do things that end up glorifying God and not just, not just your body. Well, I love, yeah. I, I love that you just went there on, on the idea of, um, no masculinity. Cause I really think that that's something that we, uh, are doing a terrible job at in our culture. Um, but even for you, you know, you were in Texas and I'm sure the way that you, you know, sp- maybe maybe not the way you speak is different, but audiences are different in Texas than you are in Washington, right? You just mentioned the Washington Post and you live in DC. So how do you feel like you've had to kind of maybe circumvent the audiences that, 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 that you speak to from the, from the idea of masculinity being in Texas where, you know, people that are in Texas love texas and it's probably probably more macho than maybe dc how do you feel like you've kind of had to uh just maybe evolve the way that you maybe speak in dc versus you did in texas that's a great question i'll tell you a while um right when i got here you know i was like for for anybody we're we're missionaries you're and for a pastor you're going how do i connect the word of god to the world i live in And you become a student of both. Mm -hmm. And so when I first showed up in town, I was like, let me be a student of Washington, D.C. Like, who lives here? So who should I meet that can talk to me about the city? And I remember I talked to a guy that's in – he was pretty influential in in the journalism world. And so he agreed to go to coffee. I sat down with him. And I just had my broad question of, uh, tell me about Washington, D.C. And he answered, it's a town filled with men with father wounds – who are desperately seeking power and success to fill that hole in their chest, but they're deeply insecure and their relationships are a mess. And I was like, dang, like I thought you were going to tell me like coffee shops are a good place to get a slice of pizza. But he's just pointing out like, Hey, this is what I run into all the time. And I was like, wow, we got a word for that. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we got a message for that. We got a book for that. We got, we got the clarity from our maker for that. So I felt really empowered in that to go, man, I can, the gospel truth applies wherever we go. I will say what I've noticed here that I do is I think sometimes in the South, we assume a level of biblical knowledge and not just biblical knowledge, but assume a sense that, you know, this is right. Let me just teach you how to do it. Whereas for me, I've realized in DC, I go, let me assume you're intelligent, but uninformed. 
Like you have a sharp mind, but the files about the Bible are not there. Mm -hmm. And not only are they not there, you're not sure this is true and you're not sure it's good. So I have to start a sermon from further back of going, let me show you why this text I think is true and not just true, but good. It actually meets the deepest desires of your heart in, in a way that what you're currently doing does not. And so I have to assume a level of disconnection with the text. But, you know, when I first got here, I would do a Bible study with, with young men, a lot of them working in, in pretty amazing places in the government. And I remember I just started with who's Paul and uh, they just weren't certain. You know, we were studying Second Timothy, mm -hmm. and I go, okay, these are sharp guys. These are guys making huge decisions on behalf of our country, but they're just not familiar with uh, the Word of God. So intelligent but uninformed. Let me assume nothing about what you know, and uh, that, that's wow. that's helped me as I speak up here. Yeah, well, that's even cool too, because you know, not only do you speak in DC, but you also travel really around the world and speak. You know, so you've 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 really developed a um like a, a solid toolbox of how to speak to different cultures and different people, you know, whether it is more intellectual or more, uh, you know, humor or whatever. And, and, and that's something I had, I had that question lower down, but I'll, I'll, I, I guess I can just go ahead and get to you now. Cause I love even, even just when I talk to you, you're so much smarter than me and which I, <laughs> sure. which I love. No, no, you really, you're like, you're, 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 you're a genius. But there's such a but there's such a level of relatability to it, and mm -hmm. most people who are super intellectual aren't, you know, humorous or they're not relatable. They're they're you know the, you, the, the two really don't coincide, which mm -hmm. I love, which is why I love listening to you preach because you you're so filled with truth because you you're so smart, but then again you're also, you know, you're also funny and witty and, and you you have related like you're relatable you know you've been through all the same things that you know guys my age are going through how do you feel like um have you have you kind of acquired that over time or how do you feel like maybe you're even you know we just kind of talked about preaching in texas versus dc but even just the style of preaching of being someone who is super super smart but you're also you know you also relate to people 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 that you speak to how do you feel like you've kind of um you know, your preaching styles even just changed over the last couple of decades? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I, um, I think for me, I'm built to be a student. I like to try to learn and discover things. And I think you, you take that and aim it in good directions for me. So I really want to study the word of God. Well, it's what drove me to go to seminary and learn the original languages. I'm like, I really want to understand it. But then I also want to understand the people I'm talking to. And it always made me crazy when you'd listen to guys that kind of would study the Bible and then hide the meaning behind like really big words. Or they would say like, well, what the this text really means. And and slowly we're undermining people's ability to read the word of God. And you're like, dude, Koine Greek, Koine means common. It was the street level Greek. This book was literally written for fishermen, for street level dudes. And so if you're trying to remove that ability to understand it from people, you're vacating your very job as a teacher. The job of a teacher is to take the complex and make it simple, to make the obscure and make it clear. Like, so to me, that's a constant challenge that I never feel like I always get there. But I'm like, how do I take this information, understand it, and articulate it to you in a way that you get it? And so when I'm studying the Word of God, I, I start by trying to learn it myself, just being a student always being in that learner position. And then I spend the back half of my time going, now, how would I explain this to you? Assuming you're an intelligent person, so I don't want to talk down to any, no one likes being talked down to, but how would I explain it to you if you weren't familiar with this information that you would go, oh, I get it. And um, I had people do that for me. You know, like when I was in high school, I don't recall ever remembering a sermon. I just, they never landed. And then I remember in college, the first time I heard a guy read a paragraph from the Bible and I thought, I don't understand it. And then he explained it for 30 minutes and then he read it at the end. And I was like, I get it. And then I burst out crying, you know, 18 year old Ben in the back of this church by myself, like embarrassing crying. Like, what am I doing? Like, I didn't even know what was going on other than I got to get out of here, you know, cause mm -hmm. I'm look ridiculous. And I was like, I, have wanted to hear from God for so long and I didn't know how to do it. And that man, that man helped me hear the voice of God. He explained it to me. And what I didn't know at that moment, but it's clear now is I want to spend the rest of my life doing that, just helping people understand. So, 
you know, last thing I'll say to that is something uh, I think I heard Francis Chan say that was really encouraging to me. I used to get real nervous when I spoke because I, I didn't want to say something dumb. I wanted to, and I realized a lot of that fear wasn't like, oh, I'm going to dishonor God. It was a fear that I wasn't going to honor me. Mm -hmm. Like it was an insecurity behind that fear of like, I want people to think I'm funny or cool or smart or profound or whatever. And it was self-focused. But there's that passage where it says Jesus looked at the crowds and he had compassion on them. That's compassion. It comes from the word lower intestines. Like he had a deep gut level reaction when he looked at them. He said, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, uh, harassed and helpless. Harassed means someone's messing with you. And helpless means you don't have the tools to make it stop. And so he looked at this crowd and he was like, man, they're just getting bombarded by the world. They lack proper tools. And he had this gut level response. And then it says, and so he taught them many things. What, what drove his teaching was a deep compassion for the people he's speaking to, not to promote himself, not to build a platform, not to become famous. It wasn't about him. It, I mean, it was about him. He's some of God, but at the end of the day, he's like, I'm trying to help you. And so for me as a preacher, I'm like, it's not about me trying to build something for me. It's about me trying to serve you. And when I get into that headspace, you know, I get excited and I'll make a fool of myself if, if it'll help you understand what the text is saying. So I drink AG1 literally every morning. I love to drink it before I go to the gym. I love to drink it when I'm on the go. I love to drink it really just all the time. And AG1 is a daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. And I gave it a try a while ago, one, because I just wanted to test it out. I was saying it on social media and a lot of people that I uh, follow were trying it and I wanted to give it a try. And because usually in the past, I don't like taking pills, I don't like taking vitamins, and I wanted something that's easy to fit my routine and something that looked like it tasted delicious. And when I tried it, I was super surprised because it really does taste delicious. And like I said, I love fitting it in my morning routine. Before I go to the gym, sometimes if I uh, have to go train early, I'll, I'll take it after. Um, but I just love all the benefits that it gives me. And it feels like I'm giving my body something good and like I'm giving my body the nutrition that it actually craves. And AG1 was designed with ease of mind so that you can live healthier and better without having to do a lot. It's seriously the healthiest thing that you can do in just under a minute. So just once a day, you can mix one scoop of powder in water. And there are so many benefits that it has. And as I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite things about AG1 is the travel packs that it allows me to bring the health with me on the go. I travel a lot with my family. And a few weeks ago, we were at the beach and I was able to bring my AG1 with me and give me the health that I needed there. And then I ended up flying from there to go visit my brother in Philadelphia. And uh, like I said, I needed health on the go, whether it's uh, in being in an airport, I was stuck, I was delayed in Atlanta for eight hours and I needed something healthy. So thankfully I had my AG1 travel pack with me there. And there's so many people in my family that I've gotten to try it. As I mentioned before, my mom and my dad have both tried it and they take it. Uh, I've gotten both my sister-in-laws, uh, one of my sister-in-law on, on my side of the family and then on Sadie's side of the family, I've gotten both of them to try it and they've loved it so far. Um, and so many friends and family I've gotten a ton of the duck hall room guys on it, specifically John David. Um, he was a guest in the past and yeah, everyone that I've lent it to loves it. And every scoop of AG1 is packed with 75 vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and whole food source ingredients of high quality that give me major benefits like gut and mood support, boosted energy. Uh, it improves my hair and my nails and it also gives me healthy looking skin. And I'm always looking for life hacks, and AG1 is the best for that. It's an all-in-one foundational nutritional formula that makes it easy for me to cover my nutritional bases every single day. So if you want to take ownership of your health, try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash huff. That's drinkag1.com slash huff. Go check it out. Yeah, that's so good. That's so powerful. When you first kind of just started talking about that, I was thinking about the verse. Um, I think it's in Corinthians where Paul's talking about, you know, knowledge puffs up, but love, but love builds up. Um, yeah. And just this idea of, and and maybe maybe you could you can speak to this because, like I said, you are someone who is very very smart, and I think there's you know there's there's so many facets of life of where you know you have someone who goes to seminary that maybe becomes pharisaical then you have someone who doesn't then they're you know cynical towards towards someone who's who, who's really smart there's so many you know there's so many things and really just the root of all of it is just checking your own heart how do you yeah. you know just because of that verse you know knowledge puffs up how do you feel like you know, and, I, and i know it's pride and, and 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 so many things but why do you think so often that you know 
the more knowledge we kind of consume, it becomes easier for us to just think that we're better than people yeah. or smarter than people. Well, I think, you know, um, it's interesting. Genesis, we're made in the image of God, right? So we're made to look like him, be like him. When worship of God goes out the window, what's the most God-like thing? Me. Mm-hmm. So I become the center of my life. And then it becomes, how do I get power and glory for me? And so people go, well, what's the thing I can get that makes me awesome or, or more awesome than you? And if it's my capacity to get big, like you said, I can take something good, like care for my body and stewardship and make it an instrument of arrogance to lord over you. So I can make physical strength my thing, or I can make knowledge. I can consume a lot of books, read more than you. And so I'll talk down to you and try to make you feel dumb. Why? So I'll feel bigger. And so we all, if we're not careful, that that broken part of us, the godless part of us that wants to deify ourselves will take good things and twist them and make them bad gods. You know, mm-hmm. and so I think with knowledge, that's a thing guys do. They just use it. They'll they'll read books and then go, "Oh, this will make me smarter than you, or appear better than you." And it's ugly. No one likes being talked to that way. But but it's the danger with it. And that's um, you know, I think of what Paul told Timothy. He said, "The goal of our instruction is love," and I love that. He was like, "What's the end goal of all this learning? It has to become love. Mm-hmm. That as I'm studying who God is." It needs to become love for God. As I'm studying about how people work, it has to become a a genuine concern for people. And so I tell guys that if all your time in the study doesn't become love, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. You look more like a Pharisee and less like Jesus. You got to stop that. So, you know, the Puritans used to say godly study is light for the mind and heat for the heart. I said, it's a fire. It's logic on fire. So that I pray that all the time when I'm studying. I'm like, God, open my eyes, like the psalmist said that I might behold the wonderful things in your law. Like they're really there, but open my eyes to see them. And then he says, incline my heart to your testimonies and not towards getting gain, which is wild. He was like, the normal inclination of my heart is towards gain for me. How do I get more power, more influence, more money, more whatever for me? And he's like, Lord, get me off that incline and get me inclined towards knowing you, loving you, understanding your word. So anytime I go into the study, I just pray that God illuminate my mind and then warm my heart that this knowledge becomes love and that is that'll so keep good. you from going insane and being an insufferable human being. Oh my gosh. I love that. Do you, do you know what verse that is in Psalms? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. It's in 119. No, it's in Psalm 119, but there's so many verses in there. I know. It's the one all about the word of God and, and it's, yeah. it's in there. Well, I was, I, I was wanted to talk to you about, um, you know, your book that obviously is um, the reason that I'm married now. I, I always, I always, <laughs> A credit you to uh, to me being uh, stable in my marriage and and also having two kids now. Um, oh, come on! But have you always been, you know, because even at Breakaway before, really before you wrote the book, have you always been somebody drawn towards, you know, talking about relationships? Have you always been a relationship guru? <laughs> no, and I mean that's the, I mean that's what's you know my buddies my age still think the the reality that I wrote a book on relationships is hilarious because I was famous as every relationship was just a dumpster fire. Like I didn't know what was going on. And uh, whenever guys would talk in college about who's going to get married or whatever, there was no debate. Ben will be the last one to get married if at all, you know? And I wouldn't dispute that. I'm like, yeah, that's probably about right. And, and I was, all my groomsmen were married. (laughs) I was the last guy into that world. And so, uh, but, you know, I think for me, uh, it did start in my 20s. I started to realize the goal of singleness is not necessarily marriage because not everyone who's single gets married. I just don't like Jesus didn't get married. Mm-hmm. And so he either failed at being single or singleness isn't ultimately about getting married. Paul didn't get married. So what is the purpose of singleness? And I remember like single Ben in his 20s, in his apartment, really going like, Lord, what is the purpose of this season of my life? It will end either by marriage or death. What's the purpose of it? And studying that in first Corinthians fired me up just going like, I have a reason for this season that I'm in. And so that kind of launched the first part of that book. And then when I became a director of breakaway and was working with college students, it was right when social media took off. And I watched this massive shift in human interaction 
throw so much confusion into the dating world. And so I was just the guy standing at the street corner with a heart of love for young people and watching them. Bro, a massive cultural shift has really complicated what's supposed to be this beautiful, mystical union of, of a guy and a girl pairing off is now become so much stress and pain and confusion and hurt. And so me writing a book on relationships really came out of a pastoral love for young people and saying, let me just try to give you as much biblical clarity and wisdom as I can. So I had no desire to be the dating guy, but uh, I'm happy to be that guy if it's helpful. Happy to do it. I love it. I love it. Well, I mean, it really, you know, because I mean, I, I, I'm sure you, you did not realize it was going to have as much success as it's, as it's had and, and, and as it's still having. Um, you know, well, even just you kind of talking about when you were 18 and, and being in the back of the church and your friends making jokes, maybe that you might be the last one to, um, to get married to, you know, then to you leading breakaway um, and kind of being at, by, being in a different season of, of, of your life really with the, you know, at the forefront of social media, what all, you know, because I do think it's, it's just self-centeredness and just, and just self-consumption, but what, what other maybe intricacies have you, do you think that relationships have changed since you were in college to now, you know, with like, like with social media, I mean, I'm sure it's, you know, men pursuing women and, and, and all these other things, but what do you maybe think's the root of why we are just so bad at relationships right now? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are, what I realized is, is a lot of times, and I see it up here too, because I'm in a town of, of a huge percentage of 20s and 30 year olds that are single. And what can be easy to do is make it all about yourself. You know, of just going like, why is no one women will ask asking me out or guys are going, why can I not meet a girl? And, and there is obviously a personal element. It's your life. But I do think it's helpful to pull back and go, but what are some broader cultural trends that you're in the midst of that are not your fault? They are your problem. You got to figure out how to swim in that ocean and that current, but it's not necessarily your fault. And um, there, there's a couple. I mean, one is that uh, Jean Twenge actually talks about it in her book on generations. She's got all this survey study of how different generations were raised differently and millennials and Gen Z people started having less kids. You know, women were entering the workforce, having kids later, having less kids. And so those kids were kind of protected longer. Um, education was extended. You think in like Joe Biden's age group, half of them never finished high school. I mean, somebody had to shuck the corn and slop the hogs. So, you know, that, that's not that long ago. Those dudes are still alive. But what you had happen was in a younger generation, she calls it the slow life strategy. It's just, no, just don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry to get married. Don't be in a hurry to have kids. Just don't be in a hurry. And it's extended adolescence where people don't enter what they would traditionally call adulthood till much later. You know, we sort of marvel at that. Like in the Bible, women were getting married in their teens and having kids were moms in their teens. And now you have um, the average woman not having a kid till, till in her thirties. So some of that you go, that, that's just the movement of technology mm -hmm. has changed the way we live our lives. We tend to sort of linger longer in education, linger longer in adolescence. And that was a world you were being brought into. I think with social media, it's designed to grab your attention. It's an attention economy. So it's designed to grab your attention. And so what's happening is you can look at charts and say, where young people back in the 80s and 90s, after school, Dude, you got on your bike and rode around the neighborhood to see what people were up to, you know, find mm -hmm. your friends. And there just wasn't this other way to connect, really. You start dialing people on the phone to find them, but you ended up socializing in front of human beings a lot longer. And the more the world got digitized now, um, where people spent zero hours on their phone, you can't look at a phone back in the day. Now it was 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, three hours a day, eight hours a day. Now on my phone, and it's disrupted the ability to have in a uh, person interaction. And so it was interesting for me when I first showed up at breakaway as the director, I did a series on dating and guys were all asking like, okay, I've asked this girl out. She said, yes, I'm getting to know her. How do I talk to her parents? Like asking a girl out, going on a few dates, that was just so natural for them. They were doing it all the time. 
And then, um, I, I mean, I became director right when the iPhone came out. So think about how fast all that happened. Mm -hmm. That was 07. And then I do another dating series that became the book in 2015, 16. And so not even 10 years later and guys were like, so if I like a girl, I just talk to her. I was like, oh man, like just, and I realized they're not dumb. They're not constitutionally weaker. They've literally just had less reps. You know, mm -hmm. when you're throwing a ball every day, you're going to get better at it. You're not throwing it at all. It's going to feel awkward. And early 2000s, guys were asking girls out all the time. Nowadays, it's just very rare. And um, for, for a couple reasons, but... Um, Even just with social media, you know, I think personally, I think Snapchat's one of the one of the worst things ever. I mean, if you something that was created to send nude pictures to people like I, I i struggle with like oh but it can be used as a tool to see friends and family from whatever but it's just like i don't know because so much of its program you know if, if you go on if, if you get on snapchat at least this is how it was when i was in high school it would be you know cosmopolitan articles on you know top 10 best sex positions and, and all these just all these terrible things and then if you take if you take that and then you then you have a Snapchat from a girl at your school. It's like you're you you've just been consumed with with with, with these sexual lusts, and then you then you channel that and and into doing this stuff, um, which is just terrible. And I think that you know even just from us not doing relationships right, I think we're we're in a time where and and, and I, maybe it was you know because I I know it's always been things similar to this, but it's such like a hookup culture, right? It's like oh, what's your Snapchat? Let me you know, send me pictures or what like, it's just, it's just so perverse, but even just that idea of, of, you know, hookup culture, even for, apart from us doing relationships wrong is, I mean, it was, was, was that something that was even prevalent, you know, when you were going through high school and college or has social media even impacted just this whole idea of just, just the hookup kind of culture that we live in. So we talk a lot about pornography on this podcast because it's really just something that I've struggled with in the past. A lot of my guests have struggled with in the past and even just a lot of my friends. And so throughout high school and then even early on into college, pornography was something that I, I really did wrestle with. And I uh, knew at the time that I shouldn't have been you know, looking at it, but at the same time, everybody that I knew was struggling with it. So um, I really just kind of got lost in that phase of everyone I knew was doing it. And I knew better, but I didn't really necessarily have many guidelines to help me. And if I would have known about Covenant Eyes when I was in high school or college, it really would have helped me from a lot of um, pain, a lot of confusion that I ended up struggling with later on in college and even in, you know, even in a, a dating and engagement and marriage. And if I would have had this in high school, it really would have helped uh, me from a lot of stumbling, from a lot of temptations. And that's why I think this would be a perfect thing for you. If you have ever struggled with this, if you're struggling with it now, or if you're worried that maybe sometime in the future, you might backslide. And we all need biblical accountability, especially when we're by ourselves for a lot of times. Maybe we're not always going to have our friends around us to help keep us accountable. And we are always on our phones. You know, screen time is higher than ever. And what that means is that we're on our phones for a lot of the day. And a lot of times we're isolated. So we need some extra accountability. And that's why Covenant Eyes, uh, for me, has been super helpful. And for those I know, it's been super helpful to have a platform that helps prohibit stuff that you might be tempted to look at. And if you choose so, when you sign up, you can choose an ally who will receive your device reports and walk with you towards a life free of porn and the life that God has blessed for you to live. And that's really how Covenant Eyes works is through accountability and just having something that can keep you accountable when you're by yourselves. And freedom and healing can be found today when you sign up. So don't let shame keep you from the life God has for you. Take back your life, your marriage, your relationships, Try it for free for 30 days by visiting CovenantEyes.com and entering promo code HUFF at checkout. There's an app, but you're going to want to sign up on the website first. Go to CovenantEyes.com, promo code HUFF at checkout. Statistically, if you look at it, my generation was uh, having you know, actual sex with a person in the room with you uh, more often and younger than, than the current generation. You know, yeah. so, but, um, you know, we were the last generation that grew up without high definition online pornography, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, what happened to your generation is where social media kind of disproportionately hurts young women, you know, because it's, 
it consumes them with body image, insecurity about their body, people commenting about their body. That popularity is always a concern for young women as they're growing up. And now it's like, has a numerical value, you know, exactly how many people follow you. That can be really emotionally distressing for young women, like teenage girls growing up. And for guys, um, this massive onslaught of pornography is new. I mean, you th- you know, a young mm-hmm. man right now has a chance to see exponentially more nude women in the morning before he gets out of bed than all of his ancestors combined. <laughs> yeah, you know, like you just think me like this is a massive human shift. Okay, yeah. like things have changed, and um, that that messes with us in a variety of ways. Um, one, um, it takes something good, sexuality, and, and just fires shame into it. Because now it's something I'm doing by myself on a screen. And you see guys that have prolonged exposure to, to um, pornography have difficulty in social interaction, difficulty, just basic things, eye contact, talking to women. It messes with their ability to socialize, mm-hmm. which messes with your ability to make friends, messes with your ability to go on dates. It, it, and so, again, it prolongs the whole dating and marriage thing. It's so damaging. Um, and then two, it teaches you to disassociate the human soul. Let me separate my emotional life from the physical life. You know, so now we live in a day where it's like, I can see every contour of a human being's body, but I don't know how to talk to them. And so you've got guys that are just awash in pornographic imagery, but loneliness among young people is exponentially higher. And because of loneliness is higher, depression is higher. Uh, this shattering of the human experience has been really damaging to young Mm -hmm. people because you're meant to keep them together. Your, your, your emotional life and your physical life are meant to go together. And, um, you know, the, I think the sexual revolution was a terrible idea that's done untold damage and it's just been picking up speed. And right now it's at its full speed, I think with young people. Yeah. And now you have secular sources like Louise Perry Christine Emba and others saying like, hey, this new sexual revolution is bad for young people. It's bad for women. It's bad for men. And it's interesting because I've read so many secular books this last year, Christian, about the sexual revolution. Disconnect your sexual experience from your emotional life. All these books, they're not looking at the Bible. They're looking at just data and saying, this is bad. And when they look at the solution, they go, if if you, they basically sound like Paul to the Corinthians, you know? You're, you're doing, you're sinning against your own body. Mm-hmm. You're, you're meant to love somebody and commit to them and then share your physical life with someone you've committed to emotionally. You're not supposed to separate your emotional life from your sexual life. And so again, the culture stumbling backwards into Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5. Yeah. Because I mean, I really do think, you know, I mean, would, would you say it, 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 a lot of it is just the excess that we have of it now? Because I mean, if, I mean, if you listen to, I mean, even music in the 70s and 80s, it's still, you know, a lot of the stuff is still super sexual, right? You have yeah. Playboy that, like, that, you know, that was kind of big in, in those early years. So there, so it's it's still prevalent, right? But but like you yeah. said, it's just not the the excess that you have it now. It's not, you can wake up and before you even get out of bed, there's, you know, a million different, you know, searches that, that you could do with, millions of images you know that they, 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 that you could just look at or whatever um because yeah it's it, it's weird it's like it's all really been there you know i mean you, I mean, you, you look at the bible yeah. you know you look at you know people doing sexual per- perversion stuff for the last th- tens of thousands of years or how I, I i always i don't know how long uh you know who, who, who knows creation stuff yeah. but whatever yeah. i mean ho- however long it's been but now it really is just the excess that i think we have of it to where, you know, you can get something you want, you know, with whenever you want with, with, with no one ever knowing about it. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, you look in the Bible when, when humanity rebels against God in Genesis three, um, you know, you get a genealogy right after Cain and Abel, which normally we skip genealogies. They're boring. You're like, so-and-so begat so-and-so who cares. Mm -hmm. But if you count, it's going seven generations from Abraham down the line of Cain and says, let me show you what happens to a godless man at the number of perfection, seven. And you get a guy named Lamech, which means conqueror. And you learn two things about him in this poem. He says a poem to his two wives, 
So where God said in the garden, the two will become one flesh, he says, no, I want multiple women for me. And you see, rather than using his strength to care for women, this man uses his God-given strength to use women. And you go, okay, so there's a sexual degradation of women here. And he says, if a young man wounds me, I'm going to kill him. If Cain's avenged sevenfold, Lamech's seventy-sevenfold. You see this proliferation of violence where I will murder you for even wounding me. And so you see this arrogant violence and arrogant sexual exploitation comes right out of the garden. Mm -hmm. So that brokenness in us has always been there. I think you're absolutely right. And it manifests itself with, uh, in, in our sexuality and in violence. But it is true that what, what you tend to see makes generations so different is the technologies they're grown up with, mm -hmm. you know, and in your generation, the big technological shift has been the massive onslaught of social media, which, you know, there can be positive aspects. Like you said, there are ways to communicate the truth and the gospel. There are good ways to use it. But one of the things that happened was a train started by Playboy in the 60s and 70s. Let's present a sexuality devoid of emotional care. But now on the internet, you can be caught up in it like a tsunami. Yeah. And we're looking and going, it's not good for the human soul. It's not good for us. It, it's it's pinging a brokenness in us. And I think people can be shamed by that. What I hope to do when I talk about it so much is just go, hey, sin dies in the light. You, you expose it. And that's where you can get healing. And, mm -hmm. and I don't want to shame men further into a corner. Just go, hey, let's walk out of this, you know, and for me, um, you know, pornography showed up early in my story, when, like a lot of guys, when I wasn't looking for it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, discovered it when I wasn't looking for it, saw a lot of it growing up. And um, it became, you know, what Patrick Carnes, who is one of the leading voices on sexual addiction, says, um, he says, addiction's an intimacy disorder. People tend to go to addictive things because they don't know how to process their feelings. So they go to get a chemical experience that'll make them feel good. Uh, or to that will numb some pain. And so if you're taking a pain numbing medication, you're numbing a pain that's telling you something's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you broke your arm and you just keep popping drugs, you go, dude, as soon as you quit taking the drugs, you'll feel the pain and that pain's telling you your arm's broke. So go get your arm fixed, go to a doctor, right? Uh, when we incessantly go to porn, usually we're trying to heal some sort of wound in us. And um, you go, hey, we got to find ways to cut all this out, radically cut this out. You know, like Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And he's not literally saying rip your eye out because you can lust with your other eye, but he's saying get radical in eliminating it from your life. What will happen is it'll expose some pain in you. And then you can take that pain to the great physician to get healed for, for God to really work on your soul to say, what does it look like to be somebody who combines uh, my emotional need for intimacy with the physical care of a woman who I'm married to? You know? Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, because I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm even similar. You know, it, it showed up early on for me too. I, I don't even remember if I was looking for it or not, or if it just showed up. I, I was, I mean, I'm, I, I, I was probably looking for it just for, as a byproduct of, you know, sport locker rooms and stuff. Um, yeah. But I don't really remember just the onset of it. But yeah, no, it was detrimental to them. I mean, just awful. I mean, this, and, and and especially too, even you know, you talked about the shame part. You know, I was experiencing shame of that before I was even really truly following Jesus, right? I mean, I was, you know, grew up in church. I knew who Jesus was, whatever, but I, I wasn't actually like, you know, I, 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 I was a hardcore Romans 10, nine, which I, I do love Romans 10, nine, but I do think that sometimes, you know, just placating that just of just, well, I, I confessed he's Lord so I can do whatever I want. I was just really caught up in that. Cause I did not know that, you know, what's this idea of, how do you? How does it actually change the way that you live, and and not just making everything you do about going to church on Sunday? Because that's that's really what I, you know, what I really thought. And I kind of want to shift to, um, you know, I talk about going to church on Sunday and that really being the whole, the whole end goal of, of of what I thought faith was. Right? It's like, well, if I can just go to church on Sunday, that doesn't really matter what I do throughout the week. And I think a lot of people, you know, have that false perspective of. If I can just get back in church, or if I can just show up to church, then my the rest of my life is going to be good. Or maybe like I can do whatever I want as long as I'm in church on Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we we might agree on that. We might disagree. I don't, I don't really know. Um, but what do you feel like is something that the church is getting right? Kind of at, we're at this 
where we're at right now in, in this point in history and what do you think that it's maybe getting wrong? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I'd say for me, um, you know, addressing what you said earlier, like I, I got to the point where um, when I was a young man, I, I had my church experience and then my life and they just seemed like they didn't connect. And I realized I wanted integrity. I wanted to be the same inside and out. And I wanted to not waste my life. You know, I, mm-hmm. I had a one of my best friends in high school take his own life. And I remember standing at his grave by myself and saying, this kid was more popular than me. He was more funny than me. Um, he had everything going for him that I don't. And he killed himself. Why am I still alive? Just going through all that crisis. And I turned it of like, well, I'm not going to waste my life. It just became a resolve for me of like, I want to really live. I don't want to play around. I don't want to play games. I don't want to be fake. I want to live life in a real way with a real purpose that really means something. And so that was a driver in me of, um, and and I think they're deeply God-given drives that deep in the human soul, Mm -hmm. we want belonging and we want mattering. I want to be a part of a community that cares about me and a part of a cause that's worthy of my life, right? That's why we love Lord of the Rings and Marvel and Band of Brothers. I want to be a part of a community and I want to be a part of a cause. I want intimacy. I want impact. This is hardwired into everyone's soul. And if all the church presents is, you know, you should drink a little less, like that doesn't stir the human soul. And that's not really what you see happening in the Bible. I mean, God... I was looking at this the other day. He promised no one an easy life. Like Abraham's life was easy. Hey, you're inheriting your dad's deal. Just kick back. You're fine. God's like, no, sell everything and move to a hostile land where you'll be threatened constantly. And you're like, why is that good? Because you get to be a part of touching eternity. That's why. You know, Jeremiah, I'm going to give you a scroll that you eat and it gives you the very words of God. And no one's going to listen to you. They're going to beat you up and throw you in a mud hole. You know, and you're like, that doesn't sound good. And you're like, yeah, it does. Cause he lived a life that was worth something, man. And yeah. I think um, if we're going to inspire people, we have to connect what the Bible has always done. The meaning of human life with people's everyday lived experience. How does the eternal touch down with the mundane? And it's why people walk away. Oftentimes they go, I don't understand how this book is relevant to my life. And it's funny up here, man, because I had a had a guy come to church and he didn't want to go. His wife brought him. <clears throat> and then we were at a party later hanging out and he was like, hey man, that's really wild. Like uh you were just up there reading the Bible and uh then you like you explained it. I was like, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's what I do. And he was like, yeah, and it actually like uh sort of made sense in like the real world. Like in my life, like, yeah, yeah, it does. The God who made you inspired it. And it was mind blowing for him. And he's like, and I want more of that. And so, you know, a lot of people I think thought I would run into a lot of hostility up here. We run into people that, I mean, they'll tell me out in front of church that they don't believe this, not sure if they do, but they're coming back because they go, this is touching down on, I believe there's an eternal purpose for my soul and I don't know what it is. I think as pastors, we need to help people connect that. How does the word of God contact the real world? And if you can get people there with a compelling vision, they'll keep coming back. Yeah, that's so good. Well, we're, um, you know, we're, we're close enough that I feel like I can ask you this question because it, it, it is something that I feel like to some extent kind of confuses me. And, and, and trust me, I love, I love the church. I've, I have nothing against the church, but I do, you know, there are things that's like just for instance, most of every church that I go to, we travel to, it's typically three to four worship songs, um, announcements, and then a message, which is awesome. But I think that sometimes, I think that sometimes we can get super programmatic with things. Of we we have you know X amount of services. We have to make sure we get people in, get people out. You know, it's going to be these three songs for every service. It's going to be you know. Here's what's happening on the bulletin and, you know, here's what we have coming up. We have kids, you know, kids week and all, all which, which are great things. But I think sometimes, sometimes to me, just the way that I feel like we can do things sometimes just, it can just can feel redundant 
And that's just what I just kind of, what I, what I feel sometimes, but I do think that some churches kind of present it differently, but why do you, I mean, what do you think that is that almost, at least maybe in, you know, in the West, it's, it, it really all kind of has a similar feel of, you know, worship announcements message. I, I, I don't know. I just, you know, as a pastor and as someone who, you know, leads, leads such a big movement, why do you feel like yeah. that style of things is maybe something that we've kind of fling, flung to? Yeah, man. You know, I became a church history major to kind of try to figure some of it out, like figure out the family tree. So I can go back and go, there's beautiful reasons for so much of, you know, singing moves the human heart. Uh, Martin Luther said it, uh, music is the mistress and governess of the human heart because by her, all the emotions are swayed. And he said, and anyone who disagrees is a clod and not worthy to be called a man. So that was Martin Luther, who's always sort of attacking people at the end. But um, you go, okay, music helps get our minds and hearts connected to the message. So music has a value. Okay, so let's sing in church. That's cool. And in the uh, Bible, it says singing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So you go to old churches and the pews would literally face each other to fulfill what Ephesians 5 is saying. We're going to sing to each other these truths to help each other remember it. And then it became, yeah, songs help with memory and stir the heart. That's great. And then it was, you know, a discovery of, of Bible study that let's open the word of God and understand it. So let's put the Bible up front and let's explain it to people. And hey, then you really want to get them into the community. Acts chapter two says they were gathering at the temple altogether and then breaking bread in homes. So let's tell them about how we can get them into homes. So let's do the announcements. And suddenly you got worship and announcements and teaching. They all came from really good reasons. But you know, like you and I can have the same workout program. And when you go, you're tuned in, mind muscle connection, you know, you're really focused on form and, and you're going to experience gains. And I'm there like, bop, 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 and I'm, you know, kind of don't care and whatever and sort of stretch. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's not going to be the same life change because I, I took some, I lost the why. And so I lost the intensity and connection to the what. Mm-hmm. And great what's only happen because of great whys. And so, I think worship's good. I think informing people's good, teaching the Bible's good. But when you see someone up there that's not on fire by what you're talking about, yeah, you're never going to be more passionate than the person on stage proclaiming it. And so when they lose the compelling why, and I'm not saying pastors have all lost this, but I think that's the danger in churches is you just get into the routine and you're not fired up by the why. Yeah. And I tell guys that when I study the Bible, I'm like, study it to ex- to understand it. And then study it till it lights you on fire, till you understand that why this matters to people. And I had a young guy ask me once, he was like, man, like you're on stage and a lot of times you're just so passionate about this. Like you look like you really mean it. Like what's the secret of that? And I'm like, you want to know the secret? And he goes, yeah. And I go, I really mean it. Like <laughs> I really believe what we're doing here matters. Like yeah. I'm buying what I'm selling. And uh, I think if you can keep that intensity you may end up shifting, like you were talking about, you know, you may shift up the format and that's fine. Yeah. Sing at the beginning. And I've gone to churches that don't sing at all. Yeah. I think all that methodology can change, but no matter what your method, you'll die yeah. if you don't have the meaning shot through the method. And that's what I think churches have to keep is that intensity of, I really believe this will change your life. You know? Yeah, for Those sure. People up there are on fire. For sure. Yeah. Cause, cause, cause I mean, don't get me wrong. I love, I love a solid. I mean, worship is one of my favorite things ever. I, I love a solid worship set. I love and I, and and even just you know things in the community. I love you know we're doing this drive or or you know this is going to fund this project and even and even even solid teaching. I was just you know just this idea of if you can you know because I think I think sometimes just even the idea of like predictability can yeah. kind of maybe just bleed or just kind of breed complacency of like, oh, I know I'm yeah. going to show up on Sunday and it's going to be, you know, one of these eight songs I'm going to sing for the last three months. And, you know, it's going to be the same announcements with the same girl or the same guy. And it's going to be, you know, a message around, you know, whatever. Because yeah. like like you said, man, I think they're all great things and I think they're all passed down from awesome things. I'm just like, you know, sometimes I'm just, sometimes I just, I just wonder if, you know, be, I mean, even just if, if to some extent just being overly predictable, you know, with the format, if that just makes you, you know, more comfortable. 
Because I'm like, if, yeah. if I show up to church and it's like, and it, it's 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 you talking for an hour and there's no worship, that that feels different. Or next yeah. Sunday it's you know 45 minutes of worship and then you get up there for 10 minutes and you talk about, hey, this is something that I feel like God spoke to me this week. I just want to maybe leave you with this passing thought. You know, yeah. even just because I do think that sometimes changing up things can be beneficial, just from the sense of totally. like. Hey, that felt different than you know than last week or whatever. Uh, yeah. But then it's a double edged sword because then it's like, but then if you get into a thing where it's like, you know, then someone's like, well, I'm only going to come when he speaks for an hour. I'm only going to come when it's more worship because I don't want to hear him talk for so long. You know, so that it, it's a double edged sword like that. But I'm always yeah. just like, how I feel like some I feel like sometimes things in the church we we've just gotten to where they can just feel super predictable. And it's yeah. just like this is this is what you're gonna get, and it's gonna be every single Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what I think too. To, to answer your question about what we need in the church today, it's interesting, man. Like, there is a public facing, big proclaiming moment. You know, like Jesus did that. I mean, Jesus would organize them. I'm gonna get in this boat. It conducts sound better. I'm gonna get these people sitting on a mount. And he kind of built critical mass and then had the big Sermon on the Mount moment. You're like, okay, he wasn't afraid of the big moment. He orchestrated big moments. Yeah. But he really prioritized training these men. And the further his ministry goes along, watch how much he prioritized training his men, not just being in a small group, but training these men. You know, um, I, I teach young guys Mark 3 all the time where I said, what's the goal of an apostle? because uh, the pastor says, and he appointed the 12 that they might be with him and teach and cast out demons. And they're like, uh, well, to preach and cast out demons. I'm like, no, what's the number one priority? And it's like to be with him. You're like, yeah. He was like, walk with me, see what I do, see how I live, and then you will become like me. And uh, that process of mentorship, apprenticeship can get lost. And so if church only becomes the production, it feels shallow and it feels, it's not changing your life. So then you start asking, what am I even doing here? But if it's just a piece of the puzzle where you're showing yeah. up and, hey, I listened to him talk for 30 minutes. It was a good idea. And then, you know, during this week, I was mentored uh, by a guy that would sit down with me and go, okay, well, how's that working for you? What are you doing? What's changing in your life? And that challenge of accountability that's personal, then you look up at the end of a year at church and you go, I'm a better person than I was last year. Uh, I'm involved in better things. I'm less involved in broken things. And you start to look and go, I'm advancing. Well, then church is inspiring to you, but I think it's one of the biggest pieces that's missing from our church is the discipleship, personal, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and one-on-two, three kind of dynamic that encourages life change because it's, it's harder to count, you know, nickels mm -hmm. and noses are easier to count. Having a big crowd feels good. Discipleship slower, messier. But I think if we have a shallow church, it's because we've missed the deeper thing. Yeah, that's so good. Because you just talked about Mark 3. And there's, you know, so much of that, and even just the Great Commission, there's so much of of going out, right? You know, you're talking about discipleship and, you know, pairing discipleship with evangelism and, and, and bringing people in. And what, this this quote I heard a few years ago, it's one of the most, it's just super, super profound. It's, it's, it's very, very interesting. I can't remember who said it, but he said that, he said that the church has become, instead of fishers of men, we've become keepers of the aquarium. And mm -hmm. just this idea of instead of going out and bringing people in, we can just so focus on the fish that we do have and, you know, caring for them and making sure that they're happy and yada, yada, yada. Instead of going out and, and, and bringing in, you know, lost people. And I don't know, just after hearing that, it really just changed a lot of my perspective of, you know, how can we just continually go evangelize and invite people in and, and just bring people. Cause I do think that sometimes we can just be so just inward focused on, you know, the people that we mm -hmm. do have, we can maybe lose sight of bringing the people out that we don't have, you know, and, and, yeah, and Mark three, where Jesus talks about, you know, you, you'll do all these things, you know, it's, it's built on, you know, traveling. It's like, you're going to go to these towns and, you know, some of them are going to welcome you. You're going to shake the dust off your feet. Like there's so much of, going yeah. and doing and, and, and teaching the things that I've commanded you to have that I've commanded you to do, um, teach them to obey it. So much of it is getting out and, and going yeah. to proclaim the word and going to share your faith and going to be evangelistic. And I think that that's something that, yeah, I think that's something that we've kind of lost. Yeah, man. You know, we used to, um, um, 
for me when I was a youth pastor, I would watch guys like like Second Timothy look for reliable men who are able to teach others, you know, and entrust to them what I gave to you. So I would watch in our ministry who are reliable guys that are showing up that are able to do something with what I'm giving them. And I remember I the first time I ever did it, identifying some young men that I'm like, they're reliable and they're able. They could they could really do something with what I'm teaching them. And and I would do these one-on-one kind of discipleship moments with guys. And the first thing I would do is draw a picture where I would take them through the gospel, like and write Bible verses all over it and say, this is how you share the gospel with somebody. And I was like, now I want you to memorize all these verses and um, see if you can explain it back to me. And then it was like, hey, I want you to go share it with somebody. And you could tell it terrorized them. Uh, at some level, they were like nervous about being rejected. But once they did it, they were excited and wanted to do it more. And then I brought on college interns and I would have them call students on our roster and take them out to lunch or coffee or snow cones and be like, hey, some of them are going to be Christian. Some of them aren't. You got to figure that out. And what are you going to do? And it was fun to watch these college students get excited. They're like, we're helping people answer some of their biggest questions in life. No God. Like, it's not just maintaining the pool party. It's, it's, I'm actually engaging people relationally. And I I think for us in DC, what's helpful for that is we don't really have like a foyer at our church. You know, we're sort of in the party part of town, Yeah. but the front of the church is the street. Yeah. And so we set our coffee up out in the streets. We set the hang space out in the streets. And so where we are, you know, it's people that are coming from the embassies, people from the government, and it's people that are living on that street. And so when you're out front, I mean, it's everybody. And when we did baptisms, it was right there. So we're on the on the side of Florida Street baptizing people. And so your faith had to spill out on the streets. Yeah. And it's been a fun experience because you go, oh, this is real time talking about why we're here, what we're doing. And we've had people that were, dude, leaving the club, s- s- stick around because church had started, you know? Yeah. <laughs> people on their way to brunch, uh, getting ready to to go wild at brunch. Uh, slip into church beforehand and having church in the middle of the streets has, I think helped us shorten that distance that you're talking about between what am I learning about my faith and, and it, does it matter when I hit the streets of the city? And I like it, our church that that's really landing together. That's been inspiring to me. Yeah, definitely. We're at a, we're at a, we're at a fun and interesting place. I'm definitely I mean, just trying to be authentic and just relatable because i mean everything that guys are going through now are things that i've walked through i've been a, a and an, uh an idiot plenty of time i was gonna use a different word but it was, wouldn't be appropriate for the podcast <laughs> i mean i've been an idiot plenty of times so just trying to just keep that sense of like hey i've been there uh yeah. it's not all that it's cracked up to be don't you know don't don't waste your life and actually live for something better and uh and see what god can do with it well yeah man man this has been honestly this has been the easiest I don't want to say the easiest podcast, but that, that might not sound like a compliment. It's been the easiest conversation that, I, that I've had. So I oh, good. also my voice just cracked there, I think, but whatever. Uh, but no, man, seriously, thank you so much. This has been the most natural, maybe that's the better word, most natural conversations that I've, that I've gotten to have. So yeah, very appreciative of you and uh, love you and Donna so much and what you guys are doing at Passion in DC and uh, hope to see you guys soon. Thanks, brother. Well, we love you guys. We're cheering you on, man.